Welcome to our Java Review 1 tutorial. This is the first of a series of Java Review tutorials offered for my course at the University of Georgia. In this tutorial, we will learn how to create a simple Java program in Eclipse. We will also review some basic Java concepts. In this set of review tutorials, we're going to create several Java programs which calculate the average of a set of numbers. Before we can write any program though, we should think about what the program is going to do and how to solve the problem. I always tell my students that you can never write a program that solves a pro general problem if you do not know how to solve that problem on your own. So let's think about how to calculate an average for a set of numbers before we write a program that does that. First, we would get the list of numbers. For example, we might have the list shown here. Next, we can add the numbers to get the sum. The sum of these numbers is equal to 35. We would also need to count the numbers to get the count. As you can see, there are seven numbers in this set of numbers. Notice the order of events. We are doing three things one after the other. This is called sequence. Of course, we could alter this sequence a little bit. We could do step three as number two and step two as number three because we can get the count before the sum. However, we have to do both of those before we can do the next step. The fourth thing we would need to do is to calculate the average by dividing the sum by the count. For this set of numbers, we would get an average of 5. 35 divided by 7 equals 5. With most programs, we would also want to provide output to whoever's using the program. So we'd want to output the results somewhere. These are the five basic steps of calculating an average. If the set of numbers was different, we could still follow these basic steps to calculate and show the average for any set of numbers. Now that we know what we're going to do when we write the program, let's get started by working on an example project using the Eclipse IDE. To start a Java project in Eclipse, from the File menu, select New, then Java Project. Each new thing you create in Eclipse will provide a dialog box for you to fill in before you get started working on that new thing. It's very important that you take your time to fill in these dialog boxes correctly because they will generate some code automatically for you depending on your entries. Here we'll fill in the project name. Let's call this one Average 1. I'll check the other ones. We're going to put this in our workspace for Eclipse. Generally, if your Eclipse is set up correctly, then the JRE should be selected automatically. We'll go with the default project layout. Let's have a look at the next page before moving on. On this page, it shows that we will generally create our Java classes and put them in a source folder for the project click finish and see what happens. Not a whole lot. For some of you, your layout for Eclipse may have changed so that you have the Java normal perspective. Let's have a look at what Eclipse has created for us in the Project Explorer. If you expand the Average 1 project, you see that there are two subsections or folders. One is Source, that is where we're going to put our Java class or classes. And the other is the JRE system library. This is the regular Java class library that we need to write Java code. The basic Java objects and classes that we want to use, such as string and others, can be found here. To continue, we need to create our first Java class inside the source folder. First, let's begin by actually organizing our project a bit further by creating a package. Right-click on the source folder 
and select New from the pop-up menu. Then we'll select Package. We'll call our package My Package. After clicking Finish, you'll notice that now under the Source folder it looks like another icon with My Package, and the icon is supposed to connote a package that you might send through UPS or FedEx. Now, right-click on My Package and select New. From the pop-up menu, select Class. If you do not see Class in this list, click Other and you can search for the type of thing that you're going to want to create in Eclipse, Class being one of those. Class is the basic Java class. The new Java class dialog appears and we need to fill this one out carefully. We are primarily going to only add the name of the class. Let's call our class Average Controller. Notice that the source folder is the source folder for our project and this class is going to be created within our My Package package. Other items on this dialog we will take as the default. So click Finish. After clicking Finish, notice what has been created for us. In the Project Explorer, you can see that there is the file called AverageController.java. Notice the file extension. All Java classes in the view where we can read and edit have a Java extension. When they are compiled at runtime to make a class, the corresponding file will have a .class extension. We also see that the editor screen has popped up with a little bit of code generated for us. Since this is a very basic Java class, it's very basic code that's here. Let's have a little bit of a look at this code and then we'll talk about some of the concepts that are already evident in this very small snippet. First, there is the package line. This line tells the compiler that the particular class, Average Controller, is within the My Package package. Let's explore that concept a little bit more. In Java, a package is a named collection of Java class files. There are some basic rules about packages. First, packages are a way to organize your class files a bit more. It's a best practice to do so, even though it is not required by the JVM to put your classes in packages. What is required is if your class file is stored in a package, you must have the package statement as the first executable statement in the class file. Back for a brief moment to our Eclipse program, the next line that we see is the line that says public class average controller. Of course, average controller is the name that we gave to our file. Also evidence in the tab and the project explorer. Public means that this file is available to any Java class that has access to my package. And of course, class is the Java keyword that says here is where the definition of the class begins. The braces are here to indicate all of the things that are going to be defined as part of this class. Before we continue, let's explore the concept of class a bit more. With Java, we are creating what are known as object-oriented programs. An object-oriented program is generally a collection of objects that work together to perform a task at hand. Objects can be said to live and die to do their work when the object-oriented program is running or executing. When programming, we write class files. The class files are the definitions for those objects that work together when the program is running. So the file that we are writing is basically defining something that will exist when our project runs. A Java class is a general template for a set of objects that will run in our program. So think of the Java class as defining characteristics about these objects. Two basic characteristics, also known as members of any Java class. These are the fields, sometimes known as instance variables, 
because an instance of an object will have particular values for its fields. The fields describe the data values that a specific object will hold. The values of fields at any time represents the state of that object. The methods are small bits of program logic. Methods describe what the object can do. You can also see here the general syntax for describing a Java class. Before we continue with our program, let's talk a little bit about naming things in Java. The people who created Java came up with a standard set of naming conventions. We have to name a lot of things when we're creating Java programs. Among these are classes, variables, methods, and some other items. The people who created the Java language came up with a standard set of naming conventions so that we can easily know right away when we see a name what type of Java thing it is. For example, classes. We've already named one. Classes should be nouns, a noun that describes what the objects are. These should be in mixed case with the first letter of each word capitalized. If the class name has more than one word, the word should be compressed, no spaces in between. Methods which describe what an object of the class can do should be verbs. These are in mixed case, but the first letter is lowercase, and then the first letter of each internal word capitalized. Similarly, for variables, they should be short yet meaningful. Many times these are nouns, and it should be mnemonic something that's designed to indicate to a casual reader what the intent of the variable is. These should be named similar to methods with mixed case with lowercase first letter and internal words starting with capital letters. Let's continue writing our program in Eclipse. First we're going to start with one of the most important methods in all of Java. Please type the following public static void main parentheses string square braces args then outside of the parentheses add a pair of curly braces you should be able to tell that this is a method because there is a method name followed by parentheses which indicates the arguments or parameters for that method why did I say that main was the most important method? Primarily because every Java program must have a main method in it somewhere. Most object-oriented programs include multiple class files. So when you tell your program to run, how does it know where to start? Answer, the main method, the one that we just now typed inside of our program. The main method is where any Java program starts running. Every Java program will have a main method somewhere. For some of you, you may not have seen this before. For example, if you've used an IDE known as BlueJ, BlueJ takes care of the main for you, so you did not have to write this. The syntax for the main method is always as shown here. Public, meaning the method is available to any class that has access to the current class. Static which means this method is considered to be class level. There is only one version of this method regardless of how many objects are created from the class. Void represents the return type for this method and in this case void as you know is the keyword that means nothing is returned from this method. And then main. Main is the word that is reserved for this special method only. In the parentheses we have string followed by a set of square braces. This means that we're going to have a string array. The string array will be called args. So the only parameter for the main method is the string array called args. Most of the time we will not use this array, but it may be used if you are allowing someone to start the program with special initialization values. Inside the braces is where we put our code for the main method. So it's inside this main method that we will write our code to calculate an average. Remember the steps we listed when we were thinking before programming. 
I'm going to add one here. We're going to need some variables to hold on to the values. So let's add one step called create and initialize variables. Please type the following along with me. Double average equals zero. Here we've created what we call a primitive variable. We named our variable average. We've said that the variable will be of data type double, meaning it can have a fractional part, and we've initialized it to zero. We'll use average as the variable to hold the final result. Let's create another variable called int sum equals zero. Here we've created a second variable. This is also primitive. This one is of type int, meaning it's an integer number, no fractional portion, and we've set it to zero initially. In both of these statements, we've actually done two things at once. We have declared a variable, in this case int sum, and we have initialized it. You could actually do that in two steps if you prefer. We'll do that here just for illustrative purposes. Let's create a variable called count to hold our count. That's all we'll do on that line. Then on the next line, let's initialize that to zero as well. So far we've created three variables and initialized them and these will hold the values that we'll create in our program. Let's talk a little bit more about primitive variables. In Java there are two kinds of Java variables, primitives and objects. A primitive variable only holds values. This means it has no behavior, does not have any methods. Primitive variables are declared with data type such as double or int and a name such as average or count. Primitive variables are instantiated when they are assigned their first value. And we've seen we can do that in the same line where we declare the variable, or we could do that at a different time. Primitive variables have data types. This table lists the various data types that you can use in Java. In fact, this is all of the primitive data types used in Java. Examine the table you'll notice there's a description of the type of value that can be held. We have used int for integer. Notice there are three different integer data types. The difference here is the size of number you can put into each. Notice short has only numbers that are up to about 32,767, or the same distance on the negative side. If you go to int and then long, you get much bigger numbers. Primarily, this is because larger amounts of memory space are used to store these integer variables. Similarly, with float and double, we see that we have two different data types that can hold numbers with decimal portions. Again, these use different memory sizes to hold different numbers of significant digits. Others of interest are Boolean, generally used for true or false, character or care, which holds a single alphanumeric character. Back here at our program, let's uh, double click on the tab. If you double click on the tab, it fills up the entire screen. This is helpful when you start to get longer lines as we will in the next line. Also notice on the tab the asterisk. This means that we have not saved recently, so it's a good idea to, to save frequently, so let's do so now. Our first step when we were thought before programming was to get the numbers. We're going to keep it simple right now. We're going to just type in the numbers that we want for our example. But we need to hold them in something. As it's a list of numbers, it would be nice to hold them in something that is designed to hold lists of things. In Java, we have something for that, and it is known as an array. So type after me int for int, follow this by a pair of square braces. That will define an array of integers. Let's call our array 
numbers, so this is the name of our array variable, and we can immediately initialize this by writing a list of numbers in curly braces. I'm going to keep these numbers simple, 5, 1, 9, 0, 10, 3, and 7. I kept these numbers to something I can easily calculate the correct results for. Another important thing to do in programming is to test often. And if you want to test your code, you need to know what the expected value is so that you can run the code and compare the actual value to what you expect. An array is a named collection of variable data. Primitive arrays hold primitive data types. Hence, we created an int array to hold integers. There are other types of collections that can hold objects. The basic syntax for declaring and creating an array is to write the data type, follow that by square brackets. Incidentally, you could put the square brackets after the array name instead. Then the array name, in this case, my array. Then to instantiate it, you do equal the keyword new, and then the data type with the number of positions that you want into it. These can be separated into two steps if you prefer. You cannot add values to the array until you have instantiated the array's size. After executing a line like this, you might imagine that in the computer's memory is an area known as my array with five slots. Each of these slots are numbered or given what we call an index value. And that's how we refer to the slots, by the array name and its index value. For example, if we want to set the value of the slot my array at index 2 equal to 8, we can use a line like this. This is an assignment statement. Assignment statements evaluate an expression on the right of the equal and then assign it to whatever is on the left. So in this case, the right evaluates to 8, and that's assigned to the slot with the index of 2 in the my array. Let's add some more numbers just to complete the array. We might also want to look in the array to get numbers out as part of an expression and assign them to something else. So for example, we might look in position 3, index 3. We see that there is a 7 located there. We might read that as 7 and then assign the value 7 to the new integer declared here as x. And x is now 7. So back in our program, we have created an array called numbers. It has 7 slots. The index of the first slot is 0. So numbers, so the numbers array at position 0 is currently equal to 5. What about the numbers at position 3? What is that equal to? If you said 9, you're incorrect because the actual value is 0. Keep in mind that index of arrays always starts counting at 0. So this is 0, 1, 2, 3. What about the last position in the array? There are seven numbers in this array, so what is the last position? Well, if we count at zero, then that is index number six, and it's currently equal to seven. What's the next thing we need to do? According to our list, we wanted to sum the numbers. Let's think a little bit more about how we might do that. Many times when programming, you think about what you're going to do, then you come across a step that you also need to think harder about and break it down into more steps. So what are we going to actually do when we sum these numbers? We would take 5 plus 1. We would get 6. We would then add 9 to get 15. Add 0 to get 15. 10 to get 25. Plus 3 to get 28. Plus 7 to get 35. How can we do that each time? Well, notice we've started sum equal to 0, and then basically 
we're going to repetitively add the next number each time. At the end of adding all of those numbers, we should have a final sum. So we're going to repeat over and over whatever the current sum is plus the next value. Let's talk a little bit about the flow of control. Flow of control represents the order in which instructions in your program are going to be executed. There are basically three flows of control that any program needs to run. These are sequence, branching, and repetition. Sequence means one after the other. Our current code, we declare our variable average, then we declare our variable sum, then we declare count, and so on. One line, then the next, then the next. Sequence governs most of what we do in any computer program we do. However, sometimes we need to choose to do some statements and not do others. This is called branching. We implement branching in Java programs with if statements or possibly select statements. Still other times we will get out of sequence because we want to repeat things. We want to go back and start over at an earlier point and do things again. This is called repetition. In Java we use while, do while, and for. Sometimes we call these loops. Currently, we are using sequence in this program, and now we want to repeat something over and over. We want to take the current value of sum and add the next value. For this one, I am going to use a for loop. The basic syntax of a for loop is to start with the keyword for, then in parentheses you want to indicate your starting point, your condition for continuing, followed by a semicolon, and then an incrementer. I'll say more about that in a moment. The code that's going to be repeated will then be within curly braces that immediately follow the parameters of the loop. We want to start at the first point of our array. So for the starting point, let's create a variable to represent the index, and let's set that to zero. Recall that the first index of our array is zero. The variable index, you can think of this as what we're going to call our loop counter variable. The condition for continuing needs to be a logical expression. Recall that logical expressions are evaluated by Java to be either true or false. They use such operators as greater than, less than, equal to, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or not equal to. The condition for continuing is basically a logical condition that as long as it's true, we will go back in and repeat the loop. We want to write this in such a way that if it's true, repeat. So we want to keep going as long as index is less than 7. I could have written this in a couple of other ways, but is this going to be true as long as we want it to be? Since we're dealing with an index which is an integer, if it's 0, that's OK. If it's 1, that's OK. 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Sure, from 0 up to 6, I'll go in and add the number. But if I get to 7, I will need to stop. Now the incrementer. In this case, we've created a variable called index. If index does not change, we will repeat this loop forever, a condition known as an infinite loop, because index will always be 0, and that 0 is always less than 7. So I need to do something to change index every time I go through to repeat this. And that is what the incrementer expression will be. One format is to do index equal index plus 1. Perfectly acceptable 
expression. Each time we come here, we will set index the first time, do the code, at the ending brace we will increment the value, and then we'll come back and check the expression. Is the new value for index still less than 7? If it's true, we repeat the code, and so forth. So index equal to 0. Do we go in? Yes. Do the stuff. Increments the counter variable here. Goes back up and checks. Index is now 1. Is that less than zero, 7? Sure. It's now 2. Is that less than 7? Yeah, go in there and do it. 3. Do it again. 4. Do it again. 5, 6, 7. Less than 7? No. Then come back, then jump on the other side of the loop and continue on with the sequence. Now, I have written this a little bit more verbose than I have to. A couple special ways that I could write this that have the same meaning. One, a shorthand way, is if I use plus equal as the operator, it is equivalent to using the variable, taking it on the right side of the expression, and adding what this value is to it. So I'd have index plus one, then reassigning that to index. A shorthand for what I have done before. Notice though, if I put two, that would be index is equal to index plus 2. Index plus equal 1 is used so often that there's still another shorthand version. This would be index plus plus. Again, this is equivalent to saying index equals index plus 1. So what do I want to do each time through the loop? I want to take my sum, whatever it currently is, first time is 0, and I want to add to it the value from our numbers array that is at the index position. I want to take this value and then I want to assign it back to the variable sum so that it is updated. Here we have a loop that will calculate the sum. Think it through. First time we run the program, we set double, average equal to zero, sum equal to zero, count equal to zero. We declare our numbers array. Get to the four. First time we're here, int index is created equal to zero. Is index less than seven? Yes, it's zero. So let's add sum, which is zero, plus the value that's at numbers position zero. So now sum is five. You can keep up with that on a piece of paper or over here at the side by saying sum. Let's start over equal to zero index equal to zero. Once we go in, we have now changed the sum to five. Get to the final brace of the loop. We increment index. So index is now one. Is index still less than seven? Yes. So we go in sum, which is five, plus numbers at index 1, which is 1. That is now 5 plus 1 is 6, so now sum is equal to 6. I'll go a bit quicker now. End of loop, index becomes 2. It's 2 less than 7, it's true. Sum 6 plus numbers at position 2 is 9. Sum becomes 15. Index is incremented to 3 still less than 7, position 3 is 0, sum remains the same, index becomes 4, still true that it's less than 7, position 4 has 10, 15 plus 10 is 25, index becomes 5, still less than 7, and position 5 is a 3, so sum becomes 28, index becomes 6, index is still less than 7, is true, Position 6 is a 7, so sum becomes 35. Index becomes 7. At this point, we go back to our top of the loop. We check our condition. This time it's false. So we jump out of the loop and continue on with our sequence. 
One interesting thing, what's happened to our two variables, sum and index? At this point, sum is equal to 35, as you might expect, because we calculated. But what about the variable index? It does not exist. Since index was declared as part of the loop, when the loop is finished, index is not available. Sum is available because we declared it at the top of our class. With our sum, we did a little bit of very basic Java math. The basic Java math operators, not the only ones, are shown here in this table. Note that math operators do have an order of precedence. Division and multiplication have equal precedence. Addition and subtraction are also equal together, but less precedent than division and multiplication. And then finally, assignment. This means as we read left to right in a mathematical expression, any division and multiplication is going to be done left to right before additions and subtractions. The entire math expression will be evaluated before the assignment is made. Now this precedence can be altered with the use of parentheses. So back in our program, let's finish up calculating an average. Recall that the third step was to count the numbers. There are a couple of ways to do this. I'm going to use a loop again, just for practice. Let's try a while loop at this time. While loops use an expression. While some condition is true, we go into the, the loop. We still need to have a starting point, the condition to continue, and something to increment. So let's initialize a variable. I'll call this one index as well, equal to zero. While index less than 7 seems to be a reasonable condition to continue in here. Then we want to count, let's do plus plus to increment our count. What do you think? Is this a good loop? Not yet. The problem here, this would be another infinite loop because the index would never be greater than 7. It is always 0. Remember the three parts from the for loop? Starting condition, continuing condition, an incrementer. We still need those with a while in this format. So I need to increment my index. For some of you, you may have figured out a much easier way to get the count of the numbers. One hint is a property of an array can be used. The only reason I used a while loop in this case was for the opportunity to review a while loop. We are now ready to calculate our final average. This is very simple. We just say average equals sum divided by count. Our final step is to output the results. Save, double click on my tab before we write this last line. What you do to output the results depends on where you want to see the results. Are the results going to be printed on a printer? Are they going to some graphical display on the screen? Is it some type of analog control to go to an actuator on a device? Could be any of those things. In this case, we're going to use the most convenient, and that is to print our results to a window in Eclipse, namely the console window. We can do this easily enough by using the system, notice the big S, dot out dot print line command. Let's print out all three of our variables, so I'm going to put sum equal plus so, let's talk a little bit about this line before we write the other two. System starts with a capital S. You'll note it's a class. 
contains several useful class fields, so it's part of our Java language. Class that came with the JRE system library. Somebody else wrote that class. It has a method called out. Out's a method that can be used to send out what we call a print stream. A print stream object would then have a print line method. Print line method prints a string, whatever string is created inside the parentheses. In this case, we have concatenated a literal string. Literals fall between quotes. We've concatenated or added to it the value that is currently held in our sum. So we can create strings by what we call concatenation and you can think of them as adding string parts together. When we concatenate there are no spaces so I've included a space at the end of my equal sign. Let's add two more lines, one for our count and our average. Let's save the program. Final step in writing our program is to test it. We should be able to run our program and then see inside of the console some count and average on separate lines. Before we can test it, we need to know what we expect. If we look at the numbers, we'll see that there are seven of them, so count should be seven. They add up to 35, so sum should be 35, and 35 divided by seven is equal to five, which is our average. To run a program in Eclipse, there are several ways. The, my preferred method is to right-click on the project at hand, then do Run as Java Application. Notice, after a moment, program compiles and then runs, so we see that our actual values are the same as our expected. Before we declare our program to be perfect, we need to test it with other arrays. For instance, what happens if we, let's say for convenience, we get rid of the last two numbers. Expected results are five numbers. They add to 25, and we get an average of five. Let's see if our program runs now. I'll save my changes. Right-click and run the program. Uh-oh, now I see an error. Exception in thread main. This tells me it's in my main program, my main method. Java lang array index out of bounds. Exception at a particular location, line 18. I click on it and it takes me right there. So something happens, the array index is out of bounds. What did I do? When I ran it, I read that error message and I'm trying to interpret what it tells me to find the problem. Can you see the problem? Notice we say that index less than 7. Seven's hard-coded, but our array, the index only goes up to 4. When we had 3 and 7 included, index 7 worked fine because there were that many. Now index could go up to 6 before this becomes false. How can I fix this? One possibility, instead of using 7, I would like to peg that to the actual size of my array. Notice if I type the array numbers and I hit a dot, there's a nice property or field for any array called its length. So now I'm saying as long as index is less than the length. Does that work? The length is 7. I have index up to 6 because, remember, I can start at 0. What about when there are 5 numbers? The length is 5, but the upper index is 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that should work. Before I go on, let's go down and fix this one as well. Save. Run. Ah, that looks much better.
So we tested our code and we fixed an error that we had created. With most programs, I would do several more tests at least before I would declare it to be a pretty good program. In this case, it's a pretty simple program, so I'm fairly confident. I'm going to end the tutorial here. Next time, we'll explore other concepts such as how do we add methods to our average class. This has been a Piercy production.